Where would you like me to be? Wherever you want, honestly. I'll be quick. Okay, we are live here. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for tuning into Lessons of Solidarity and Resistance from the Border. Uh, what can the prison abolition movement learn from the migrant justice movement to empty jail cells and other sites of confinement while building caring communities and abolitionist futures? Uh, my name is David Hennessy. I'm a member of the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project. Um, I make websites for social justice organizations, and I've been dealing with uh, criminalization all of my life and uh, all of most of my family's life. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to be your moderator tonight because we have so many amazing people presenting tonight. We have uh, Harsha Walia, Swathi Sekar, Laddie Smith, Mike Tunji and Suhail Benzelman. And I'll just read off their bios and the groups they organize with um, at the end of my intro here. So just a quick note on accessibility and recording. Uh, we do have ASL interpreters here, um, as you can see, and we will be doing uh, closed captioning um, through YouTube and touching up any bits that need uh, fixing as well. So if anyone wants to watch the video later after it's been recorded, it should have good uh, captions. We're going to start the evening with a land acknowledgement. Um, we're going to provide the purpose and background for having this discussion in the first place. We're going to shout out our comrades and sponsors and then provide uh, speaker bios and the format of the discussion. Um, before we get going in, this, in the discussion, Swathi Sekar will start us off uh, by giving us an update on yesterday's Supreme Court of Canada decision um, about immigration detention. And following the update, we're going to start the discussion. So first off, let me say that CPEP organizes on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people, specifically the Anishinaabe of the Nipissings, Temiskamings, the Abitibi, the Tete de Boule, and the Jean de Terre among others who have lived and do live in this place we call Ottawa. I'd like to offer this acknowledgement as a way to remember why we're doing all this work in the first place, 
Uh, remember our indigenous teachers, land and water defenders and comrades who have learned, uh, who we have learned from in the struggle. And as a way to acknowledge how we settlers of different identities uh, benefit from the ongoing genocide and colonization of indigenous peoples and their lands. It is therefore an obligation to be in solidarity with indigenous peoples on Turtle Island in very concrete ways. Today's topics of discussion are particularly, particularly linked to colonial practices as borders and cages are tools used by the colonizers to facilitate their blood and land thirsty missions. Borders are used by colonial forces to contain indigenous peoples, separate them from their communities and ancestral lands and rob them uh, of their lands. CPAP reiterates its commitment to working under the guidance of indigenous leaders toward decolonial futures. Abolition is impossible without decolonization. Getting into the purpose of the webinar and a bit of background, um, the purpose of today's webinar is to share knowledge and learn from migrant justice organizers. Uh, simply put, as abolitionists, we want to get better at getting people out of prison and resisting state violence and forcible confinement. We think that it is important to hear from other people and groups who have been more successful at this. Um, as background, CPEP, the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project, the Abolition Coalition, and numerous other abolitionist groups from coast to coast uh, spent last year documenting the cases of COVID-19 in jails and prisons, penitentiaries, and immigration detention facilities across so-called Canada while also advocating for the release of all prisoners. Like most of you, we were busy. <laughs> Over the course of the year, some prisoners in provincial prisons were released, demonstrating the ability of the province to simply release people, while the federal government largely did nothing. The cases of COVID behind bars keep skyrocketing to this day, and Doug Ford wants to build more prisons, while we know that human cages are failures and fiascos in terms of their own stated purposes and amid a growing global abolitionist movement calling on the end of policing and imprisonment and punishment in all its forms. During the global pandemic, the need to decarcerate sites of human caging is more pressing than ever. When CPAP had its first meeting of 2021, the migrant justice, excuse me, the migrant justice struggle was brought up because of their success in getting people out of prison. We also knew that Harsha Walia was about to release her long awaited second book. And so we decided to ask our comrade Harsha uh, our comrades from Solidarity Across Borders, who successfully emptied an entire detention center, and the End Immigration Detention Network, who have had many successes supporting migrant detainees and release, and other groups for their stories, their teachings, their successes and failures, so that we can learn other ways to get people out of prison and build healthy communities of love and resistance. Besides that, uh, CPEP became increasingly involved in mutual aid projects and had just partnered with an organization called Hit the Streets, a black and brown queer sex worker led initiative who deliver free nutritional food, PPE, clothing and other provisions to survival sex workers, people experiencing homelessness and limited shelter, those battling the war on people who use drugs and those exiting prison in Ottawa. And now I've just got some volunteer shout outs and sponsor shout outs and a little bit of housekeeping to do before we get going. So first, I just want to shout out CPEP and the jail hotline. I want to shout out uh, CZ, who gave us the beats for the intro. Um, I'm not sure if everyone could hear them. There might have been a little technical difficulty there, but CZ uh, is an amazing artist in, in Ottawa, and you can check CZ out at their latest event, Encore Ottawa, featuring CZ. I also want to shout out uh, Chue, who made all our graphics from the, for the intro of this talk, so you can check out uh, way by just following CPAP and getting involved. Um, I want to shout out the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Carleton U, uh, Nadia Abu Zara, the Joint Chair in Women's Studies for the U of Ottawa and Carleton, the Department of Criminology at U Ottawa, the Institute of Gender and Feminist Studies at U Ottawa, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton, and the Migration and Diaspora Studies uh, program at Carleton. Um, also, I want to shout out uh, two local businesses, uh, Greens and Beans Restaurant, who have the best vegetarian and vegan Lebanese food in Ottawa. They are amazing. Um, they donate through their community. They give us things like tons of free coats, free boots for people getting out of jail, um, traditional meals for people with like Islamic needs, um, sandwiches and religious items. Um, also, Mona Lisa Clothing at Bank in Alta Vista. Uh, whose goal is to make Islamic needs accessible to everyone. They are donating new clothing, Qurans, and prayer mats to people who have Islamic needs and are getting out of prison. Um, so definitely check them out if you're in Ottawa. 
And finally, this event was organized by volunteers and activists committed to prisoner justice and prisoner support. I uh, just want to shout out CPEP, CPEP again, the jail hotline, our partnership with Hit the Streets, the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project, and the Abolition Coalition. Uh, you can go to www.cp-ep.org to learn more about the jail hotline, learn how to support prisoners during the COVID-19 crisis, um, sign some of our many emails apps, and send a message to people in power. Okay, and now finally, uh, we're going to get to the um, bios here. So we'll just do some quick introductions. First of all, uh, Harsha Walia is the author of Border and Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the Rise of Racist Nationalism. Nationalism. <laughs> she is also the award-winning author of Undoing Border Imperialism, co-author of Never Home, Legislating Discrimination in Can Canadian Immigration, as well as Red, Red Women Rising, Indigenous Women Survivors in Vancouver's Downtown East Side. Harsha has organized in grassroots migrant justice, anti-capitalist, feminist, abolitionist, and anti-imperialist movements for two decades. Trained in the law, she is the past project coordinator of the Downtown East Side Women's Center and current executive director of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Uh, Swathi Sekar is an immigration and refugee lawyer practicing in Toronto, Canada. She specializes in appeals of negative refugee and humanitarian and compassionate claims, spousal sponsorships, and LGBTQ and migrant workers' rights. Swathi appears regularly before the Immigration and Refugee Board, the Refugee Appeal Board, and the Federal Court. She has also rep represented the End Immigration Detention Network. Um, Oladipo Smith, aka Laddie, is a Nigerian undocumented immigrant living in so-called Canada facing a removal order. He moved to America in 1996 on a basketball scholarship, but got associated with the wrong group of friends in his younger days. And in 1998 was charged with conspiracy to distribute a controlled substance. And he served nine years in prison and one year of probation. After his sentence, he was released to society in America, but was still considered uh, an illegal immigrant in the States. To sustain himself, he created a transportation company to provide medical supplies and equipment for low income people. Starting his own business not only helped provide an income for him, but also allowed him to help ex-offenders that were getting out of prison by providing them a job. Uh, he says, change on any level is very difficult, particularly if you have no support. I've experienced both parts of trying to reinvent myself as an immigrant coming to a new country and also as an ex-offender trying to resuscitate my life after spending 10 years of my life in prison. Suhail Benzelman is an illegalized and criminalized migrant who is currently living on occupied, unceded, and unsurrendered Algonquin Anishinaabe territory, where he awaits an imminent deportation to Morocco. Suhail became involved in abolition, prisoner, and migrant justice, organizing as a member of the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project, a member of the Ottawa Sanctuary Network, and the coordinator of the Jail, and Account <clears throat> the jail Accountability and Information Line. Uh, through the Mutual Aid Project he coordinates, Suhail organized with incarcerated comrades several political and legal public campaigns meant to hold institutions of human caging and so-called Canada accountable for the harm it causes to criminalize peoples and their communities and to alleviate some of the harm caused by incarceration. And Michael Tunji is a former immigrant detainee held at the Central East Correctional Center. His release, <clears throat> since his release, he's advocated to end detention in Canada and has worked with groups like Migrant Detainee Support Coalition and the End Immigration Detention Network. And so now before we get into um, hearing from our guests, just quickly give you the format rundown. We're going to ask our panelists a series of questions and we're encouraging them to engage with all the questions, including those not um, addressed to them. Due to time constraints, we will try to address as many questions coming out of the chat as possible. Um, our apologies um, to everyone who's attending if we don't get to them. So first, let's start with uh, Swathi Sekar's work um, taking on the Supreme Court. Um, Swathi, are, are you there to give us an update on the Supreme Court decision today? So, sorry, sorry, Dave, before we move to that, can you just remove uh, gallery view and put it, uh, sorry, speaker view and put it on gallery view? We have trouble having the ASL interpreter on the screen at the same time as the speaker. Thank you. Oh, sure. Is that, is that better for folks? That, that's working? We'll see. Uh, it takes a little delay. Sorry about that. 
Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, um, I think we want to hear from Swathi first, um, if it's possible uh, to get an update on the Supreme Court decision today. Sure. Um, so, hi everyone. First of all, I just want to say I was I, I, I was cringing at the bio. I feel like it was taken right from my website. Um, yeah, I, I am I am a practicing lawyer in Toronto, but also um, you know fundamentally, I I really don't believe in this system, and um, I. I I struggle a lot with uh, whether or not ha how to navigate, you know, um, working in this job while also being complicit in this colonial system. And so it was cringy to hear myself uh, referred to as a lawyer. I guess I'm just self-loathing. Um, okay, so I just wanted to to actually come on um, and briefly talk about this uh, decision that came out from the Supreme the Supreme Court yesterday. Um, so I. Uh, I've been representing the End Immigration Detention Network, which is an organization, as Mike is going to talk about um, when he when he speaks, um, that really formed out of um, a hunger strike that happened in 2013 when 191 detainees at the Central East Correctional Center went on a hunger strike to protest the conditions and also to make specific demands. And so out of that arose this constitutional challenge that we um, made to basically say that Canada needs to have a maximum time limit after which um, somebody who's in immigration detention has to be released, a presumptive limit. It's many countries in the world have it and it really is something that Canada should have if we have to have this system in the first place. Um, and we also had other charter issues that we raised. We have been fighting for um, seven years through different courts to um, get these concerns raised. There have been so many amazing, um, wonderful, brave people, uh, current detainees, former detainees, their family members who really put themselves on the line to bring, to get evidence together, to, to bring this fight forward um, and to have their voices heard about what is really happening in this disgusting, shameful um, system in Canada. And, um, we have been losing we lost at the federal court. We appealed, we went to the federal court of appeal and then we most recently um, applied to the Supreme Court to have us have them hear this. Um, and then yesterday they just uh, rejected our application to be heard. So, so essentially they won't, um, they won't be hearing our arguments about whether or not this actual, this regime is constitutional, which in my view, it really isn't, um, among other things. Um, and on top of that, in addition to not letting us come forward, they, the Supreme Court took this very rare move where they actually um, ordered costs against the people who were making that challenge. So there were two appellants, there's Alvin Brown, um, I should have spoken about him before, he's the main appellant, um, he is um, now in Jamaica. He was deported to Jamaica. He has mental health issues. He's living on the street. He has been fighting uh, for years and years um, to get justice for what happened to him. He was in jail for five years um, in horrific conditions. And um, the End Immigration Detention Network is the other appellant, which is made up of migrant detainees and their families. And the Supreme Court ordered costs. So basically, punitive um, punishment for even coming forward. And those costs can range up to two grand. Um, there's nobody has any money like this, of course. And it's just, to me, really drove home how we cannot, we cannot rely on the law or these systems to actually create the change that we want. Um, it's, it's like, I know this, but it just really, I think when this decision came down for me personally, it just really drove home the fact that we can't, we can't look to these systems to create justice or to, to support people in the ways that actually need to be supported. Um, we really need to find ways to create collective power completely outside of these systems. Um, and so I also wanted to though also acknowledge that you know, through the seven years, the, the migrants who came forward with their stories, uh, there have been really amazing changes that have happened that the way immigration detention works in Canada is different because of those sacrifices. Um, and there have been concrete changes. And so I want to honor that. Um, 
it's it's what grounds me and um, what what I think we need to continue to work towards. Um, and I just wanted to bring that to people's attention because I feel like we need to to figure out ways to to do this without the state. Um, and that's that's what I had to say. So I'm really excited about this panel and I'm sorry I can't stick around, but can't wait to um, to hear everything. Hi, um, sorry, Dave, since you are the one hosting, you actually have to be the one to pin the ASL interpreters. They're currently not uh, visible on the stream at all. So if you could do that on your end, um, it doesn't work. You are muted. Okay, great. Th thanks for that, Roz. Okay, so we're gonna just get into the Q&A right now. I guess the ASL interpreter is nodding, so it looks good. Um, okay. So the first question um, we have tonight uh, is for Harsha. So Harsha, in your new book, um, you further your analysis of the border and of its entanglement with the prison industrial complex. Can you share with us some of your insights on how the border and the prison industrial complex are entangled to surveil and punish migrants? And how does your new book expand the theoretical landscape when thinking about what you call the border crisis? Um, like what are the social, political and cultural systems like the ideas and the practices that create and sustain this kind of perfect storm that sweeps away the lives of countless migrants around the world? Thank you for that. Um, can I maybe just get confirmation that ASL is, is good to go? It's still not working. So Dave, on your end, you need to make sure that they're both pinned for you. Maybe I'll just, I'll wait till it's sorted out. That'd be sure, great. sure, yeah. one second. So yeah, you're back on speaker view, I believe, Dave. Okay, so we want to be in gallery view and then. And then pin both the interpreter and Harsha. Okay, does that look good for everyone? Um, we just can't tell until yeah, it it's, it's, it's better now, yes. It's okay, better great. at least you have a few folks on the screen. Okay, great. Awesome. All right, sounds like it's good to go. Okay, thank you all. And thank you so much to the interpreters for your, your hard work. Um, thank you all for organizing this. It's, um, it's just such an honor to be here. And I really look forward to being in conversation with everyone and to Ladi, Michael and uh, to Comrade Sohail, just really looking forward to what everyone has to say and offer um, into this conversation. I'm here on the territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations and indigenous nations on these lands have never given up their jurisdiction and indigenous laws and sovereignty continues to be alive and exist on these lands. And a movement that I have been part of for many decades um, until recently was known as illegal. And one of the things that we firmly believe and you know, used to always say is no one is illegal, Canada is illegal. And that for me really is where so much of this work emerges from um, and where a lot of my theory and understanding emerges from is really from that premise, right? That no human being is illegal and certainly not on lands that have been stolen by a settler colonial state. Um, that was a big question <laughs> that you asked me, Dave. Um, and you know, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna go on for too long. Um, maybe what I would say, oh, answer your phone and turn the camera off. Not you, sorry. <laughs> I love how this panel is going to go down. <laughs> um, is uh, you know really just that the border is is a is a system of violence, right? A lot of times we think of the border as just this like map on the line, or rather a line on the map. Sorry, but it's um, it's a historic and contemporary form of violence that is intended to criminalize and exclude people. And in the same ways that you know, prisons immobilize people and control people, um, that's precisely what borders do as well, right? Borders criminalize and, and immobilize people. And the kind of um, 
the word mobility, um, I recently learned, derives from the word mob. And mob is a criminalizing vocabulary used to target black and brown people in inner cities as, and also at the border, right? The idea of the border crisis, the migrant crisis, um, the inner city crisis, those are all about controlling people. Um, I guess maybe the two things that I'll, I'll say about the border, um, which, you know, again, really comes from organizing um, and is articulated in a book, but isn't really about, you know, me as a writer, but comes from experience and organizing primarily is just how important it is to understand migrant justice and migrant and refugee rights, if you will, um, as, as connected to an internationalist movement, right? Like, Migrants and refugees don't just come to be. There are global forces in our world that are continuing, like imperialism, global capitalism, climate change, which are devastating the lands and lives of people. Most people are not moving for fun or luxury, right? This is not like a people going on a vacation, um, you know, spending all their coin on a luxury yacht. Like this is mostly folks who are looking for a better life and whose lands and communities have been devastated by a long arc of conquest and imperialism, and that those continue to exist today. And so when we think about immigration, it's really important that we situate it in that global context. And that moves us away from that framework of, you know, like Justin Trudeau's refugees welcome garbage PR, right? Um, where he talks about refugees welcome, but of course that's not the reality on the ground where people are still criminalized and illegalized. And it moves us from the charity framework to one of justice, to one of restitution, to one of reparations, to one of responsibility, and to one of internationalism. Um, the other thing about the border is that, you know, if we understand the border as a site of state violence, then we also move away from ideas of like, who's a good immigrant and who's a bad immigrant. Um, and we fight for all people, which is again, the idea of, you know, no human being is illegal, not one detention, not one deportation that, you know, folks who are fighting detention and deportation shouldn't have to prove their worthiness, right? Like we are all inherently worthy of life. Um, and that, you know, by, by understanding the border as like a tool of violence, then we move away from that politics of innocence. And I think that's also really important because oftentimes in our movements, we can get caught up in the politics of, um, you know, of respectability, of innocence, et cetera where, um, you know, of course, everyone has a story and everyone has the right to demand the right to dignity on their own terms, but that shouldn't be determinative of how other people are treated. And that, of course, is also a shared vision and abolitionist practice, right, where, um, where we believe in freedom for all people and free them all. And so um, I think, you know, that for me really is, is the basic of and no border, anti-border politics is that it's the freedom to move and the freedom to stay for all people and freedom for all people, collective liberation for all people, and that it's bound up in dismantling imperialism and state violence and racial capitalism in all its forms. Totally. Awesome. Thank, thank you for that, for that Harsha. Um, we're going to just move on to the second question uh, we have tonight. And that question is for um, Laddie, Mike, and Suhail. Um, so as organizers and lived experience experts who are living with precarious immigration statuses and facing imminent deportation, um, can you please tell us how migrants are criminalized and which systems are responsible for creating the, like the illegal, quote, illegal um, migrant? Um, who's going to go first? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, if anyone wants to jump in, I, yeah, Adi, I, if you want to go first. I, I, I jump in. Uh, I mean, uh, the the system in itself, I mean, it's, I guess, when you, when you say the word immigration, uh, uh, I figure it's like, you know, just like the first speaker said, it's like people that want a better life for themselves. Uh, but uh, I guess it's sometimes if we're not in that web, uh, we we have the tendency to to judge. So I, in my in my view, I, I think uh, uh, the system itself uh, 
stereotypes uh, immigrants in, in the first instance. Uh, you know, they show you in the light of uh, coming to this country, uh, to a different country in, in a precarious situation. Uh, and it's then once you get in, in, I mean, the US or Canada or Europe, uh, once you get in those countries, you're now forced to uh, uh, meet very difficult process, even from the get go. Uh, once you get to the border, you're, you're uh, scrutinized. And that's where the detention also comes in, uh, where you are, you're detained and questions and put in all, all kind of uh, uh, informal uh, uh, issues that is not meant for immigrants. I mean, you, you come in and you're asking for uh, a better life and a, a, a way to, to prosper yourself and, and be a part of society, but uh, you are met with so many challenges, which is not, we start away from the border. Um, I would like to piggyback on um, what um, Maharsha was saying earlier, you know, when she was tying, um, you know, she said something about mobility and um, that's really pretty much how people are criminalized, right? Like the fact that um, like migrants or people in my situation, um, you know, we have to apply for a work permit and like, you know, we have like all these um, things set up to limit our mobility, whether in seeking a job or in seeking health care, um, that automatically kind of criminalizes in a way because um like people are going to do what they they have to do right if you deny me a work permit I, I still have to eat if i work under the table that's automatically criminal if i go do something like sell drugs that's automatically criminal like like criminal you know also necessary doesn't necessarily mean wrong it just means not sanctioned by the state um and the state just wants to monopolize like certain things, you know, like for example, they like to monopolize violence. You know, they tell you violence is wrong, but when the police do it, it's okay. So they're not really against violence. They just want to monopolize it. They want to monopolize the way people work, the way people um, um, do certain things. And they put roadblocks where, okay, you can only do this if you get this permit. You know, if you get this, you know, document and that sort of thing. And migrants and people in our situation um, face a lot of those, um, I guess, steps or roadblocks or limit limitations to mobility than, I guess, full citizens. So um, just being in this situation is, is criminalizing. Well, Su Suhail, did you want to say anything to that or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, just, you know, from my own experience, you know, like I, I came here as a, as a migrant who uh, at 16 years old, like I, I didn't even accept to come here. I, I didn't want to come to this country, um, you know, and uh, was forced, you know, because my parents wanted uh, better education uh, for their children. But what does that really like entail when we examine closely um, you know, that idea of having a better life somewhere else. Uh, sometimes it is because of uh, the hegemony and the power uh, that the uh, imperialist and colonial states were able to gather in order to, uh, you know, engage uh, in this uh, politics, uh, you know, or, or even like, uh, you know, in order to uh, force uh, their power upon other uh, countries uh, to disenfranchise people, um, you know, uh, you know, Morocco or so-called Morocco, uh, which is, uh, you know, a settler colony in itself in different ways, um, you know, was a colony of France. And, you know, right now uh, it is uh, still, uh, you know, colonized through other various processes, whether economic, 
or such uh, that pushes people to move away uh, from the land uh, that was dear to them. And uh, you know, when you come here, you face many obstacles. Um, you know, you face uh, you know cultural barriers. You experience a cultural shock. Uh, you know, the values that you've been taught all your life uh, all of a sudden change. And uh, you have now to start navigating this new system of values that is oftentimes in contradiction with the values that you've been brought up with. Uh, not to say that the values here are wrong or, or something like that, but it poses a challenge because, you know, for example, your parents, you know, they don't want you to go hang out here or they don't want you to go do this. They don't even want you to work sometimes, you know, it depends of what types of, you know, family or like what family you come from. But sometimes you have to struggle through that. And, uh, you know, and, and when you struggle, you try to basically, why you struggle? Because you try to meet your needs, you know, your needs of, uh, you know, integrating with a group of friends or, um, you know, just, uh, having enough money in your pocket to go buy a beer, go buy a pack of cigarettes, and you are forced to go steal them because you don't have money. Uh, you are forced to do that. And uh, what happens to you? You're criminalized. You know, you're criminalized. You're doubly punished, first of all, as a migrant. A lot of people are doubly punished to begin with, just for existing, just for being born who you are. You're doubly punished or even triply, quadruply. You have all these things that are weighing on you, on your identities. But as a migrant, you're doubly punished, you know, because not only that you're criminalized, but, you know, um, criminal defense lawyers, they, um, you know, a lot of, you know, we talk about the, uh, you know, the plea factory, you know, they push you through the plea factory, you plead to charges, you know, when you're young, they don't consider that later on when you're going to be older, those charges are going to become like more serious because they're going to lead to your deportation, uh, you know, you are uh, you know, push through the system, you know, without really any consideration uh, of who you are. And, uh, um, you know, and, 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 and those are like legal professionals and judges uh, that, you know, uh, sentence you to these sentences uh, without taking in consideration these, uh, you know, horrible things that will happen to you down the line. So as I said, you know, like as, as migrants, you know, we, we want, you know, the, 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 the state and colonial and imperial powers, they want to contain us or, you know, they want to dispose of us. They want to extract the labors from our bodies, but they don't want our bodies to be present within their land. So, uh, you know, we always live at the border, not always inside the country, not always outside of it. Uh, and that's why I challenge the idea of the nation state as being a solution to who we are as migrants, because at the end of the day, we live, you know, within this figment or of imagination borders that are super violent, that are, you know, constructed in order to kill us, basically, uh, and you know, contain, you know, for example, the, the divide the land of indigenous people, or you know, contain them to certain lands, or you know, uh, you know, limit the movement of black people because if we look at who's getting deported the most, you know, it's like, you know, it's like black folks, you know, and like brown folks. You know, so these systems are just expense, extensions of the, of the white supremacy systems that are ruling the world. And, uh, you know, that's what criminalizes us, you know, like how we treated in the so-called justice system that, I, that a lot of people called the injustice system. And yeah, so maybe like some folks wanna like, maybe like talk on, on, on these points or yeah, I'll just leave it there. So you wouldn't feel like feel like picking that up or okay well just before we go on to the next question um i just want to do a quick thing for saldi across borders montreal um i know uh, my comrade suhail he gave us to me um this note he said just to to mention the work that saldi across solidarity across borders sorry is doing um and just highlight highlight the fact that they're doing a little fundraiser um, right now for people who are affected by the violence of Canada's immigration system um, and you know the people for the people who lead this who are leading this fight against it. Um, since March of 2020, um, Solidarity Across Borders has redistributed financial resources to help pay for rent, food, medication, and 
basic utilities for hundreds of individuals and families in their network who have been denied access to emergency government relief because of their lack of status. Um, as of September, they've redistributed over $200,000 in this way, a number which represents only a fraction of the real need for support that exists in the community. Um, just want to note that this is not charity, but it is um, solidarity. I just read a quote from their GoFundMe. Um, an active practice of solidarity, solidarity and a small movement towards redress for the generations of exploitation that have built this country into what it is today. In these times of crisis, this is what community looks like and we are so grateful for your support. So we're just going to add some ways that you can um, support the GoFundMe or send um, like an e-transfer um, into the chats on Facebook and, um, and on YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, and I guess we're just going to continue on um, with, the, with the questions now. So um, this question uh, is actually for, uh, for Laddie, so it's perfect timing. Um, Laddie, uh, Solidarity Across Borders um, did and are doing a phenomenal job supporting migrants who were uh, caged at the Laval Immigration Holding Center. Um, you and your comrades emptied the Laval Immigration Jail during the first wave of COVID-19, which is like amazing. Um, it's just truly phenomenal. Can you please shed light um, as safely as possible, obviously, on the work um, that had to be undertaken by SAB to, to realize this achievement? Like what kind of efforts and commitments made decarceration possible um, in that context? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I I want to take the time. Uh, I think you mentioned a lot of the stuff uh, that uh, sorry the cross borders do uh, for immigrants that first come into the uh, to the country. Uh, I just want to take the time to reemphasize uh, the f that that you know we we do a lot of good work here. Uh, taking care of immigrants that's coming in is, is a great challenge. I mean, uh, I think you mentioned about the food, the shelter, the clothing. Uh, but I guess what is also left out, which is a great, uh, a great need for a lot of immigrants coming in, as moral support that uh, that uh, family uh, atmosphere to to know that you have somebody to uh, uh, to go to or to talk to, uh, which uh, solidarity across borders uh, has been doing for a while. Uh, like I said, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, there was a hunger strike in Laval. Uh, in, in the beginning of March, uh, which I, I actually, I was in the detention at the time uh, this uh, was going on. Uh, I was one of these people that were uh, uh, on hunger strike in, in Laval at the time. Uh, and sorry, cross borders was able to well, it coordinate, but it, the initial uh, thing that made it more successful was, uh, SAB was already in in the detention center visiting a lot of us uh, and trying to find out our needs. Uh, they don't. They come in. They bring us hygiene products that people need that they don't really offer in the detention center. You'd be amazed at, at some of the things they are lacking in the detention center. But with the help of SAB, we were able to get uh, some of these things in. So they were already in contact. Uh, with a lot of us that were in the detention center at the time. Uh, so when the pandemic hit, uh, it was a thing to find out that, you know, this, because the, 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 border, uh, the border agents were just trying to downplay the fact that this is a safer place to be uh, other than, you know, going, getting out. But uh, we, we saw it as a, as an incubator, it's, it's, it's a place that, you know, uh, the ventilation you're sleeping next to, you're about two feet or one feet away from the next person that's sleeping next to you. It's got a room about 10 foot by 10 foot room with three or four people, bunk beds. And we just cramped in there and the airflow system was real bad. So to actually uh, say that the, the vibe we're better off in here than out where we're able to take care of ourselves was was a laughable thing. So basically, the coordination between SAB uh, coordinating with the uh, uh, social with the media and the social media, 
uh, we are able to get in contact with some lawyers, which is very effective uh, in trying to uh, petition uh, the minister, which is the hearing that you go to uh, for to get released from the detention, uh, because they hold you from variety of reasons, uh, reasons of uh, uh, they don't know who you are, but nevertheless, they have your passport. Uh, they think uh, you might be a flight risk in as much as you're trying to seek refuge. I don't know how you become a flight risk when you're trying to seek refuge, but those are the reasons why uh, they hold you up. And they also tell you that since you do not know anybody uh, 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 in Canada or where about, uh, there's no way you're going. So they tend to uh, uh, hold you because of those reasons. So uh, what SAB was able to do was uh, uh, coordinate with the media, the social media, coordinate with the lawyers, and come up with a game plan of where in the event that the, the, the minister, which is the person that's representing the immigration board, uh, decides to say they can't release you because of uh, either you, there's no way for you to stay, uh, the shelter is closed. Uh, uh, we were able to come together and find different people uh, that were volunteering their time, their house, their uh, finances uh, to bond a lot of us out. Uh, it was just one of the uh, ways that uh, we were able to uh, force the uh, uh, border uh, agents to uh, release, a, I think it was everybody uh, that was in the detention at the time of the uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, outbreak. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, the, and after you, you get out of the detention, uh, which is always my point exactly is that you, that is where the bigger problem starts because, uh, uh, apart from the fact that you do not have a work permit, uh, uh, you don't, you don't have a place to go. So Serenicate Cross Borders was able to provide all this, uh, for every individual they were coming out uh, of the detention at the time. Uh, so the, the food, the shelter, the cloning, the moral support, the transportation, the medical needs of everybody were, were taken care of adequately. Uh, I mean, I cannot say enough of this organization and, and how proud I am to be part of this organization uh, that provides such, which is what majority of us immigrants that are coming newly to a new country actually need. Uh, so I, I, I'm really uh, humbled to be the one actually speaking about this organization at this time. Uh, so uh, it's, that's, that's all I have for that. Well, thank, thank you so much, Laddie. That's, that was really amazing to hear. Um, I wanted to actually ask Mike if um, he could follow up on that. Um, we, we have a question for him. Um, could you, could you sort of build on what uh, Laddie shared um, from your own insights and sort of um, explain some of the work that it took to support migrant prisoners at the Lindsay jail during the hunger strikes um, sort of and supporting their release as well? Um, and how did you folks on the inside organize and how did your comrades on the outside support that work that you were doing on the inside? Um, so when I was in Lindsay, um, you know, we were coordinating with a group called No One Is Illegal and some other groups that are under the Eden umbrella. And they operated a phone line similar to what um, Suhail's um, group, sorry, I forgot what it's called. It was similar to the work that Suhail was doing. And um, so they were helping us to um, put our stories out into the media. And um, there was also um, another group that was doing visitations. Um, there was another group that was do doing uh, letter writings. There were you know, groups um, dropping in on um, the hearings and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I can attest to some of the things that um, a lot of people were saying about, you know, the frustrations with the hearings, but that's, that's a whole nother story. Um, 
and just organizing within it, it just took a lot of politicking to be honest you know because when i was at lindsay we had um well it got reduced but it started off as like four immigration ranges right and like oftentimes like you kind of have to have the right person that's the um like the range cleaner you know the range cleaner stays out of the range and they have more access to the phones and you know like i was a range cleaner and um i helped do laundry for like the whole like the whole pod you know so that gave me access to be able to communicate with people from the other ranges and coordinate and organize and that sort of thing so but you kind of have to have somebody that is thinking along those lines in that kind of position and then things can happen you know um i'm sorry is there any part of your question that i'm not touching because <laughs> my short-term memory is screwed up sorry you're muted dave dave you're muted oh, sorry about that no that that was a great answer uh michael thank you thank you so much for that oh no problem. um so we, um, I think for this next question, we, we want to go to Harsha. Um, as a foundational organizer with No One is Illegal, could you let us know like to what lengths organizers must go to not only effectively support people in their quest for freedom, but also to ensure folks are supported during and after their incarceration? Um, like what can CPAP and other prison abolitionists who like struggle to get people out of jail in similar ways as the migrant justice movement has done, um, what can we learn from um, the abolitionist migrant organizing? Oh, I feel like Lottie and Michael have already laid that down. <laughs> and I just have to say, I'm just having so much nostalgia because I was a, a baby when SAB started and was involved in SAB and I'm just, um, oh, I, my heart is full. <laughs> So full. So thank you all. Thank you all for all of the work that's been going on coast to coast in so many ways. And, you know, just remembering um, also the hunger strike in Lindsay and everything that went down there. Um, you know, and everyone that was holding down those trap lines and all the inside outside. I'm just <laughs> I could go on on a whole nother track, but um, I'm so grateful for this space. And I'm just so grateful that this meeting has happened and that we're hearing from Michael and Madi and Sohail. So thank you, truly. Um, I think, uh, yeah, in terms of the organizing, you know, again, I would just echo what's been said that a lot of it's, it's just the practice of care, right? Like we're hearing a lot of it is the daily work of, you know, being on the phone lines, being on the trap lines, being able to provide that support, um, which is true, no matter what kind of carceral, you know, regime you're coming out of, you're coming out of a jail or a prison or a detention center. It often looks the same, um, but I think as, you know, Ladi emphasized, there is a dynamic that is different when you're new to a country, right? Like the, the place is entirely new. The language is different. As Sohail mentioned, there's a culture shock. Um, so that level of support um, requires attention, um, you know, making sure folks have foods that they want to access. Um, a lot of that is another layer of support to tend to. Um, the one thing that I think is, um, you know, not that it's different because state violence is the same, but it often manifests differently. And I think when we're thinking strategically about how to leverage those systems without buying into them, but to leverage them, um, you know, as Lottie was saying, I think one thing that is distinct about the detention system is, this, is the review system. It's a bullshit hearing. It's a bullshit hearing. Everything about it, as you pointed out, right? Like, you're deemed a flight risk and you're like, I'm not actually going anywhere. <laughs> I'm here to stay. Or, you know, they claim that you, that you, you know, that they don't know your identity. There's a question about identity. It's like, you have all my documents, right? Like, what else do you need to know? Like all of that, or, you know, that the burden of, of proof is on you. Like now you have to prove why you have a right to be out, right? Um, the assumption is, is that you're going to be detained unless you can prove why you should be released. So you have to gather sureties. You have to show that you have somewhere to stay. Uh, you have to show that someone can cover your finances. Um, so it's, a, it's all an oppressive system, but the outside strategy is how to then leverage that, right? Like how to get someone out of detention, 
by leveraging a surety, by leveraging finances, by leveraging a home, by leveraging someone to stay with, like that is um, the way. Of course, it doesn't always work because again, the system is intended to detain people, but that is part of trying to think strategically and tactically um, and do everything that you can, right? To get, to get people out. Um, and I think that's the case for all organizing is, you know, if you believe in abolition, it doesn't you still have to work within the system, which does not mean you buy into the system, but it means you have to know it. And I always say this, right? Because I don't think anyone knows the system better than abolitionists, which is what makes you an abolitionist, because you're like, I know the system inside and out. It is rotten from the inside and out. And you know everything about this bureaucracy. You've experienced it, you've lived it. Um, one of the places actually that I was detained in many, many years ago is the Celebrity Inn in Toronto. Um, when I, you know, went through the struggles that I went through in this country, um, and you know that that place shut down, and that place shut down partly as a result of struggle. Um, I had moved out. I when I was not released, um, I wasn't involved in it right away, but heard about it after the fact that there was the struggle to shut down this detention center uh, that I'd experienced detention in. And so, you know, that is that is part of it is, you know, knowing how to leverage um, the state to never believe you can you can win against the state, but to know that we can win as social movements. Right. Like those are two different things. And I think a lot of it is um, just that it's it's abolition work, migrant justice, abolitionist work is a commitment to all people. And it's a work, as you know, Mariam Kaba would remind us, it's a work of a lot of discipline. It means showing up in a lot of different ways. And it means, of course, doing that work together, right? It's not about the one savior lawyer, as Swati mentioned, um, but it is about finding comrades in every space, people with all different skill sets and believing that we all have something to, to contribute, right? We all have something to contribute in the freedom, in the freedom struggle. Um, so I think that for me is um, in terms of the question of organizing and strategy is probably the most expansive one, which is that we need all people and uh, we need to be strategic and we need to leave no one behind. And we need to always be fighting alongside folks who are on the inside or their families on the outside, their loved ones on the outside. Um, I think the other thing that, um, has been that has been so strong in um, in migrant justice organizing when it's happened has been collective struggle right and sab is is a, is a is a significant example of that which is how do we make sure because so much of that work around supporting people can become individualized so how do we make sure that we're individually supporting people while also making sure that that is part of broader political momentum, because otherwise it can start to look like charity, right? Despite one's best intention, it can start to look like charity where you're starting to, you know, figure out who to offer what to. Um, and so a big part of that is um, the really hard work of individually meeting people where they're at and individually supporting people and also building political power, building social power, building collective power to break the isolation, because um, so much of that, you know, as Ladi was saying, is like, you just, you miss family, right? And part of politi building political power is building family, building political power, building collective struggle is breaking isolation. It's feeling together, it's feeling strength. And so I think that's the, the last thing I would say. Um, and, you know, it echoes what Michael says is you just need folks who are able to do that bridging work um, and who can help people can feel that that sense of power and struggle. Thank you for that, Arsha. That was that was a really amazing answer. Um, does anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, I. I, I go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, go oh, ahead, great, Larry. Great, yeah. great. Yeah, I just. Uh, uh, I just wanted to touch based on what I should say. There's like uh, I, I have even up to date here. We have uh, some people still in the uh, Laval detention uh, that happened uh, on March first. They were on hunger strike. Uh, I guess uh, because of a lot of pressure, uh, that hunger strike ended in September. Uh, I mean, I have a letter from uh, 
uh, I think it was six, seven of them uh, here that I can actually read, uh, where a group of migrants detained in Levada Detention Center. With this letter, we wish to denounce the condition in which we are being held at the center for some time now, the COVID virus has entered the prison. The, san the, the sanitary measures taken by the immigration officers are clearly insufficient. We have also been confined to separate rooms without receiving any psychological assistance. We are distraught and very fearful of our health. We are asking to be released from the Laval Detention Center because it is a place where virus can spread. This is a call for help. We want to be treated with dignity and above all, we want to be protected in this term of pandemic like every Canadian citizen. Uh, I mean, it is, this is the, the uh, it's like a revolving door, uh, literally, you know, when I read this, because just in March of 2019, I was uh, one of these individuals here uh, going through the same uh, process, which, you know, I, I, I didn't eat anything for about eight, nine days uh, going on a hunger strike just to get liberated uh, on, you know, just for coming. And it's not just me, it was about 40, 50 people in there at the time uh, before they start emptying it out uh, because of the hunger strike. Uh, and these individuals come in uh, as asylum seekers, you know, uh, and they're subject to all kind of cruelty. Uh, the ability to get legal counsel was uh, like none. You know, uh, you basically see your uh, your legal counsel at the hearing. Uh, they don't come and visit you and find out what's going on about your life and uh, things like that. So it is it is a call for action in that regard. I think. Well, thank you, Laddie. Suhail, did you want to jump in too? Just um, so it's... There, it looks like there's some issue with your microphone. Um, it might not be fully plugged in. Um, it's very staticky and we can't hear anything. Yeah, it's, it's still a little bit like ro ro robotic voice. Yeah, yeah, we can't, sorry, we, we can't hear you, but, um, okay. <laughs> okay, well, moving on, I think, I think the panel kind of answered the, the last two questions we had, which was um, a lot about strategy and like a lot about, um, like Harsha said, leaving no one behind, but being sort of strategic about it. Um, may, maybe I'll just briefly follow up and then we'll, we have a couple questions from the chat. Um, uh, I think, let me just go to the question I have. Um, it seems like a lot of the interactions we have um, with people in like say the nonprofit sector, um, you know, and ultimately the state um, seem to always legitimize the, the nonprofit profit sector while sort of leaving behind the grassroots people who you know are sort of on the ground do, doing the work. This this seems to be a constant thing that every activist has battled. Um, do people want to just jump in on this and and speak to their own experience of it and how they sort of worked through it and maybe who they decided to work with and who they were like, no, we're not we're not working with you that kind of thing. And I'll just I'll just leave it open. to Whoever wants to unmute and chime in on it. No, sorry, sorry. We're we still can't we still, we still can't hear you, Suhail. Sorry. I don't I don't know what's going on there. It might be your mic. Um, he's he's gonna he's gonna jump back in. Um, I can I jump in briefly, though. I would love to. I know Suhail probably has a lot of thoughts because the letter just came out. That really great letter. Um, to the nonprofits, and I'd of course love to hear what Michael and Lottie have to say. Um, maybe I can jump in because I am now deeply involved in the nonprofit industrial complex and embedded, and so um, you know have some thoughts about it. But um, you know, absolutely. I mean, I think there's millions of examples as to how and why 
you know, the state prefers working with nonprofits, um, you know, as a, as a means of, um, uh, as a means of compromise, as a means of pacification, um, as a means of legitimacy, like there's, there's so many benefits, mutual benefits to the state and capital and nonprofits to exist in the triad that they do. Um, but maybe what I think might be more useful is like, you know, what, what can that relationship look like, right? Sometimes it's ineffective and it's useless. Um, in my experience, the most useful experience is when um, grassroots movements use NGOs, <laughs> right? You're like, we need a letter because we're trying to get someone out of jail or we're trying to get someone out of a detention. Can we get your letterhead, right? Like, that is the utility of the nonprofit. Like use that letterhead when it's needed. Um, that's how I treat my job now, right? If folks need a letter, like here you go. Um, and I think that's what it is. Like never to be, never expect nonprofits absolutely to be involved um, in social movements um, in, in that way, right? But to know what the role is, know where what role they fit in the ecosystem. And if and when, grassroots movements and particularly, you know, like migrant detainees need to get out and need a letter or need a letter for their humanitarian and compassionate application or need a letter, uh, you know, for any visa application that really relies on um, relies on people um, showing those kinds of uh, credentials, which is, you know, crappy that it's even needed. And also that's reality. That's what people need to get out then that's the thing to rely on them for, right? Or if people are, you know, for example, during the hunger strike, right? Like leverage nonprofits to speak out in support of the hunger strike to amplify existing demands, right? Um, not to set the terms of uh, what the demands will be, but to amplify existing demands. Um, and this was, um, because we're talking about immigration detention specifically, I can, you know, there's lots of examples, but one example that I can give is, you know, in, in BC and in Vancouver, when Lucia Vega Jimenez committed suicide in detention center and in CBSA custody, that resulted in a massive public inquest into her death, which is, you know, now one of the reasons of many that we have this new national immigration detention framework that Swati was talking about earlier, right, which comes from grassroots movement and struggle and real pain and sacrifice, and in the case of Lucia, her life. Um, and during the, the time of that inquest, you know, a number of grassroots groups were making the demands of like end all immigration detention, right? This is not about making detention better or making the conditions of immigration better. It's about ending all immigration detention. If there are um, certain reforms, they're non reformist reforms, right? Like making sure people have increased phone access, more legal access, more visitation but not things like electronic monitoring, right? Like that's a reformist regressive reform. I mean, at the time, a number of NGOs, including the one that I currently work at, took a position that was regressive, that really put us, that put those NGOs on a track that was contrary to what grassroots movements were calling for. Um, you know, and there was a very strong pushback against those NGOs to say like, you know, you weren't even involved in any of these movements. Some of you, have not even cared about immigration detention. It's now just something that, you know, because there's a public inquiry and an inquest you want to get in on, um, you know, because now this is where this is where all the public attention is, and which is fine. Like it's great to have more people involved, but you don't even know what the demands are. You don't even know what the conditions are, um, and you know, folks really pushed back and said, you know, it would be great if you could amplify the existing demands. Right? <laughs> don't come up with your own demands that don't even originate from any place. Like you've just kind of made them up at a table. Um, and so, you know, in some instances, folks were humble about it and really then started echoing, um, you know, more movement and community oriented demands. And so I think those are the, those are the, the tense relationships. And I think um, those are real. And I think there's, you know, don't, we can never put our hopes in that system, whether or not good people are there or not, that's not what it's ever about. It's the system and a critique of the system has to, has to be consistent. Um, but it is really important that um, both, you know, that social movements really leverage nonprofits when it is of use, um, when it can amplify demands and when it can serve people's needs, right? When there is something concrete to be gained that helps bring people's 
you know, brings people's um, possibility of freedom into their lives. Um, but otherwise, I think always healthy skepticism <laughs> and, you know, and over and, you know, actively pushing back against NGOs pacification. Yeah. Th thank you for that, Harsha. Laddie, or actually Suhail, is your microphone um, working? Do you want to unmute and, and try to? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, you're sounding, you're sounding good. You're sounding great. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I know Harsha wanted to hear, hear from you. Um, so maybe you can talk about the, the letter that um, recently went out to the, the NPOs and NGOs in, in Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep my camera off just uh, not to um, mess up my uh, very, I guess, thin bandwidth. <laughs> uh, but uh, so basically, uh, you know, the nonprofits in Ottawa, they started organizing around alternatives uh, to policing, um, you know, you know, in the in the midst of the defund the police movement. And um, only when, um, you know, you know, indigenous and black folks and people of color and migrants and been struggling against cops for a long time, uh, been, you know, losing their lives on the streets, you know, in jails, in prison cells, and like supporters, abolitionists on the outside, uh, you know, have been organizing around these issues and trying to, uh, you know, push for these demands when, uh, you know, uh, people will look at them and will say, like, you folks are ide idealists and you folks are you know what I mean, are not mature or whatever, like classes or like ableist or, um, you, know, uh, you know, ways of dismissing, you know, these abolitionist discourses. But when the state started in, like investing, trying to invest in order to co-opt our movements, you know, and our the efforts of our people, they started investing in alternatives uh, to policing, which I put like between heavy quotes, because you know, those alternatives that they wanted to do anyways, they involved the police, you know, in their work. So we learned about it and we presented the demands to them, right? And uh, those demands is, you know, it's, it's stop including the Ottawa Police Service as partner on your funding proposals um, and, and end all the memoranda of understanding with the police. Do not meet with members of the Ottawa Police Service uh, and the Ottawa Police Services Board behind closed doors, cut ties with Crime Prevention Ottawa, which is like basically just cops, um, you know, understand that they are, they are, understand that there are no both side or multiple viewpoints when it comes to systems of oppression. And uh, we ask them to align themselves uh, with, you know, the, like with the demands, uh, you know, of, 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 uh, of abolitionist futures um, as per the declaration uh, that the BCCLA and other uh, organizations across uh, the land signed on to. Uh, which is choosing real safety um, declaration, historic declaration to divest from police and prisons. And um, we told them that they have to uh, dismantle uh, their own modes of operation, work towards that, right? Uh, and the third thing is, um, you know, yeah, so that's the third thing, actually. The second thing is um, dismantle, um, organize a just transition from the prison industrial complex. So like, a just transition meaning that we don't want less services for people. Like we don't want less services for people, for migrants. We don't want less services for people who needs to access certain services in the community, but we need them to do it in a way that is not problematic. And just because of that letter, the Ottawa police chief slowly almost called us terrorists, called us uh, bullies, called us, uh, you know, violent, like, uh, you know, uh, intimidating, sorry, uh, called us, you know, just because of a letter that we basically like pleading, uh, you know, for for our uh, for our freedom from these from how the nonprofits in our in so-called Ottawa particularly encroach upon movements, try to control them, organize behind doors meetings. So I think, yeah, I think, yeah, like like Harsh say, we have to you know use them when we can, you know, because some of them after the letter they came out and they said that you know this made us question our politics because abolitionism is, is, a, is, a, is a theory and a practice of change. You know, it's about believing that people and like systems and things like that can change. You know, we're not about trying to dismiss them. You know, we're just trying to say like, hey, you know, reality check. This is what's going on. This is what you're doing that is bad. And this is how it's bad. And this is time to start ending it, you know, because, but, but yeah, so some of them came out and in support of that letter, you know, 
And, you know, of course, some of them went behind our backs to the police chief and like cried to them and stuff like that. Or, you know, but some of them came in support of our movements. So, you know, that's not to be, you know, dismissed easily. But again, uh, you know, with, with caution, caution, you know, because, you know, the history shows that, you know, these like neoliberal systems are not really like liber liberatory systems, right? So, so, you know, with caution, you know, they, they don't do the work of SAB, you know, they don't do the work of end immigration detention. They don't do the work of uh, no one is illegal, you know what I mean? They basically are reliant on state funding and they don't even want to organize to sever that relationship. Thank you for that, Suhail. Laddie, did you want to jump in or, or Michael? No, I have not. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience working with NGOs, so I can't really speak much on that. Cool, cool. Okay, well, thank you both. Um, we're getting to about uh, 10 minutes before we wanted to um, to wrap up. And I, th I think we've talked a lot about NGOs. And I, I guess what, what came to my mind was like, it's really hard to ask nicely when your job is to sort of scream and, and yell and like be like, what the hell are you doing? And make a big noise about things. It's hard to sort of, it. sometimes it feels like when you talk to NGOs, like I was involved in the, in the thing with the police board, it was like, um, I don't, I don't even really know how to, how to ask nicely. It sometimes feels like you, even going to them and asking them for th things feels like I'm, I'm abandoning my comrades sometimes. So it is a, it definitely is a struggle, um, for sure. Um, so with, with that said, um, we do have a couple quick questions, um, from the chat. Um, there's one here, uh, for you, Harsha, if you, if you don't mind taking it. Um, so I'll just read it to you. It's coming from um, a refugee lawyer, and the lawyer asks, um, can Harsha speak to the awkwardness and difficulty of working both within the system um, and against the system simultaneously and how she understands the role of a lawyer outside of the system? And what can we do to best support migrants and speak out against the violence? I can try. I'm not a lawyer. I can speak as someone who's had lawyers <laughs> for a lot of different kind of reasons. Um, and, you know, I am trained in the law, so that's also a privilege that I have. Um, I guess I would say, um, for me, when I think about lawyering, I think it's important not to, um, this is not at all a comment on the person who's asking, because I don't know their context, but I'm just speaking generally. I think it can sometimes become, um, like two extremes, right? Either lawyers really see themselves as like the savior, the person who's gonna save the day and stop the detention and deportation. Or the flip side is if it, it can get really kind of navel gazing around like, I'm a lawyer, what do I do with all this? Like the skills and this privilege. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a medium, right? Which is that of course, lawyers are not saviors. Um, no profession or no person is a savior when we're thinking from the perspective of liberation, when we're thinking about how to free people and how to do it together. Um, but it is a skill set, right? And like other skill sets, um, we use it in service of liberation. And so I think, you know, that awkwardness or difficulty is really just the humility of recognizing that we have, and those who have legal skills, um, have a responsibility, have a skill set to put it in service to people. Uh, you know, to, to try to fight the system with the legal skills and to do it alongside, right? Like not on behalf of people, which means lots of tangible things, right? Like let people make the arguments that they want to make. Like one of the things that I've experienced as someone who's had a lawyer, um, who's needed a lawyer in both criminal and immigration law is, you know, being told like, oh, that argument's never gonna fly in court. And I'm like, I know it won't, but I wanna, I wanna say my piece, right? Um, and that's important because the law and the courts are, you know, disempowering their sites of violence. It's important that people um, be able to represent themselves fully. You know, you can tell somebody like, here's what might happen if you do that and let people decide. I'm not saying you don't give people the con what possible consequences may be, but that kind of, you know, um, dictating how people should or shouldn't govern themselves should not be the role of a lawyer. 
Um, but really, yeah, to, you know, to be in service, right? Which is like what all liberation and movement work is, is how do we do this work together? How do we put our different skill sets together? And how do we, how do we fight for freedom? Um, so I, you know, I, I get that there's an awkwardness to, to it. There's an awkwardness to being a lawyer. There's an awkwardness to all kinds of work that, you know, we all do. Um, and so just being humble and real about it. And a lot of it is like, you know, when we're surrounded by comrades who keep us real, then that's also the most important thing. Cause oftentimes we can live in our heads about this work. And uh, when we're doing it in, in a movement context, then I think the answers are a bit clearer because you, the work is, is right there. <laughs> like folks are like, I need this concrete thing. Can you do it or can't you? Right. So I think it's important to, maybe it's, you know, it's just like literally do the work. Well, thank you for that, Harsha. Um, and just one uh, question before we go um, for um, uh, Laddie, Michael, uh, and, and Suhail, whoever wants to sort of um, jump in. There's just um, our last question is just about fundraising. What are some of the um, fundraising strategies that have really worked for you? I mean, crowd, crowdfunding is a big one right now with GoFundMe and, and stuff like that. But um, what are some other ways that, that you've been able to um, to get the things, not only money, but but just like the necessities of life, PPE, food uh, for people who need it. And like, what's your go-to sort of uh, tactic for that, I guess? I guess uh, for us, it's, uh, it's more crowdfunding. Uh, for instance, we, uh, we organize in March, uh, the date of the March is supposed to be announced in, uh, on the 27th, we're marching to Ottawa from Montreal uh, to demand status for all. Uh, those, those organizing factors are, you know, requires funding, uh, which basically is uh, word of mouth uh, based on our works and, you know, and uh, a lot of crowdfunding, uh, uh, Facebook and all those uh, platforms to try and uh, sustain uh, those kind of activities. Well, th thank you, Laddie. Does does anyone else want to jump in? Curious to hear Michael more. Like honestly, I I don't have a lot of experience fundraising either. Um, I mean, like I've been involved in groups where we apply for grants and we've gotten it. So that's one way. We've also um, like organized like a dance kind of thing, like just rent out a space and um sell drinks non-alcoholic and let people know what we're about you know um but i wish i had more ways that i can share but i don't have a lot of experience unfortunately sorry the dance sounds awesome michael yeah thanks we did that <laughs> yeah i think um yeah i'll, I'll look at um you know, for example, the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project, uh, they have been, you know, doing some great work, really, like a lot of good work, you know, like either, you know, fundraising or, you know, uh, for example, through, through their store, which I recommend everyone uh, goes, you know, to check out, you know, so they have an active store, uh, you know, Alana from Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project makes some amazing abolitionist and political art. So, you know, fundraising through that, um, you know, you know, crowd, crowdfunding, is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit like limited, you know, because at the end of the day, we're trying to like dismantle capitalism. Like that's when like, we're going to have like enough resources for everyone, you know, because they're there, like they're just like monopolized by a very few, um, but, you know, just small things, you know, like keeping it small, we have like a, fundraiser coming for like the startup packs that we're going to start and you know Harsha sent us you know uh, 42 copies uh, of her book uh, you know and you know she can also speak better to uh, the work that she's done with um, you know uh, you know just uh, for a fundraiser for the braided warriors uh, with the book you know so like maybe like more authors coming out and you know you know with that type of support like that directly you know contribute to movement building, you know what I mean? Um, you know, offering things like we have a lot of stores uh, around Ottawa who donated 
some of their things so we can you know do a raffle you know it's really like you know small movement work is not really like nothing fancy you know what i mean like but at the end of the day you know it, it reaps some results you know like dances i wish i can do that but with covid i don't know how that gonna look like <laughs> like a zoom dance would be like super awkward just because i'm not a good dancer but but yeah but yeah so but yeah, like those type of ways, you know, like, and always like, you know, like bringing it back to the community, you know what I mean? Like, it's not only about like fundraising because it's not a charity, you know? Always keeping that political goal in mind and, you know, making sure to like disseminate that political message. Yeah, if, if, if Harsha, you wanna talk to us about like that, that quick action you did about the, with the books, with the Braided Warriors and like, tell these authors, yo, send some, <laughs> send some books. <laughs> I just had a memory speaking of dance parties um, because I know Sab had a dance party too. I remember years ago, Sab had a pinata party that made a lot of money where you had to just bought tickets to smack the pinata and <laughs> it made a lot of money. So I love that, you know, it's all, it's often the, the community ideas where folks are keen to, to get together, but. Yeah, sorry, that just the dance parties uh, have got my gears going and reminding me of all kinds of ideas. But yeah, no, the books, certainly authors, please use your books and, and raise raise money for, for communities. But again, you know, lots of, we all have different skills, right? There's different ways in which we can, um, as artists, as, you know, folks who, folks who are involved, we all have different skills that we can offer to movements to support. Uh, fundraising efforts right like we can make prints we can make graphics there's there's so much possibility um but and also fundraising to to bring people together but i'd love to i'd love to hear more from laddie and michael about the dance parties <laughs> laddie sab had one recently too right the status for all dance party yeah they, they did they have one uh, i think it was a couple months back yeah, what sorry. So, COVID, sorry. yeah, the group I was working with, um, it was formerly called TOC, you know, Toronto Organizing Committee, but we're we're called uh, Mighty Super right now. So we had like a lot of people that were involved with um, U of T. So the dance party, and and we're located by U of T. So the dance party just made um, like a lot of sense. We also um, had an art show, um, one time, because another former um, detainee. Um, he makes art, so we kind of use that as a medium to kind of um, let people know what we're about and also sell some of his art pieces. Um, there's, there's really no limit to um, like what we can do. Like I said, I don't have a lot of experience. I wasn't necessarily the person coordinating these things. You know, these are just things that, you know, I've been a part of or, you know, went along for the ride, so to speak. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks, everybody for that. Um, we are at about the 90 minute mark. So um, if, if folks have places to go, we can, uh, we could end it here. Um, it looks like I've got one quick more like a comment. It just says, um, that what else the it was sort of a question comment, like what else can we learn uh, from you? um from you all including sab and i guess one person in the in the chat who, who was like a former detainee said persistence they never give up and that that really kind of sums it up um so i, I guess we'll end it there unless anyone has any final thoughts or if anybody like wants to shout out their organization i'll just like i'll just like leave it open um and people can just shout things out and then i guess we'll close on that note Yeah, just uh, before we close, really, um, you know, I just want to share my screen here for a second, if you enable me to do that. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of folks watching right now. Um, I want folks really to go to like Sab's GoFundMe, please, if you have the means right now to do it, like go there and like support, you know, like it can be anything. If you have a lot of money, you know, go and put the money there, please. If you didn't, if you don't, if you can't do it through GoFundMe, uh, send an e-transfer 
uh, we posted the information on the chat. Um, you know, you know, go there, support the folks, please, who are doing the work. And uh, you know, have a yeah. So yeah, because yeah, we need each other. And a lot of times, you know, folks that don't even have a lot, you know, are the ones who who give a lot. So uh, if you know folks, if you can't donate yourself, uh, please go share that GoFundMe. Uh, go share their, you know, e-transfer, um, and 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 give and give them that and 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 support that cause, please. And uh, I want to, yeah, yeah, like really, uh, it would be really important for folks to do that. And um, I want to also just go on on a few uh, little things here. Um, on on the on the March twentieth, uh, it marks the first day that uh, a, a prisoner. Uh, was uh, infected by COVID-19 uh, in, 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 or, or known to be infected by COVID-19 in a carceral facility. Uh, we therefore uh, holding a Freedom Mall National Day of Action uh, that we're going to see actions uh, across the land. Um, you know, here I have the one uh, in Toronto by uh, the comrades from the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project. Uh, it's going to be uh, starting at the Maplehurst a correctional complex. They just finished a hunger strike over there that really like had no results uh, on their well-being. Uh, you know, if you are there, go support that. Um, I want to also say that here on Algonquin uh, and Anishinaabe territory, we're going to uh, have a, 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 an event as well uh, on that date. Um, please folks go do that. I want to amplify uh, a couple of things. Uh, the first one, uh, is uh, the open letter. Uh, if folks haven't done it already, uh, people in, in, uh, in, in provincial uh, sites of human Cajun uh, has been, you know, um, you know, the cases have been scar skyrocketed in the second wave of COVID. Uh, we've drafted a letter. Um, please, folks, uh, go support that letter. Uh, we are trying to get to 2,000 signatories before we uh, send it out to the government. Uh, our first uh, contain COVID, the first edition of this letter had uh, around a thousand and, and some change signatures. Uh, please go do that as individual signatories uh, or uh, you know, as, um, as organizational ones. Uh, I would like folks um, to as well, I was talking about the, um, the, uh, the uh, GoFundMe for, uh, for our, our comrades here in Sab. I'm gonna repeat that again. Uh, please folks go there, uh, support if you can. Um, us here in the jail hotline, we have another GoFundMe just to keep like the lights on, keep paying whoever we pay uh, to do that. But you know, if folks can support that, also go ahead. Uh, you know, um, I, I would like to uh, for folks to uh, as well um, go support the Prisoner Emergency Support Fund, and um, you know, the Prisoner Emergency Support Fund uh, really has been supporting uh, people. We uh, raised 150,000 here, but uh, we were able to distribute 179,000 people. Uh, the folks from the Toronto Prisoner Rights are working hard on that thing. Um, you know, we are donating or giving, gifting, uh, you know, in solidarity, $225 uh, to former and current prisoners to pay for their canteen, uh, for their families and loved ones on the outside, um, et cetera. Um, yeah. So, you know, please look out for these actions. Please do actionable items. As you know, Harsha and other folks said, you know, this is about showing up and doing the work at the end of the day. So please folks, you know, share whatever you can, do whatever you can. And what I've learned today from, from the movement is that we, keep, we need to keep our movements grassroots while at the same time leveraging those powers, whatever we can. But the importance of like staying grassroots and, you know, need, meeting people's needs uh, really, uh, you know, that's the most important thing. You know, when someone call you like folks saying like, yo, we need food, yo, we need a letter, yo, we need this, you know, like meeting people's needs while keeping the broader political goals, you know, alive. Uh, I'm grateful to, you know, be given these closing remarks. But uh, just before I go uh, as well, uh, I would like you folks to uh, go head up uh, the Braided Warriors and uh, you know it's very important that folks uh, support. I have to do the same. Uh, oh, just braided warriors. That's 
it does the thing. Please go support as well. Uh, their PayPal is here on their bio. They have been facing, uh, you know, well, colonial violence for a long time, but they have been facing lately colonial violence because they're engaging in acts of resistance against the colonial state, uh, putting their bodies on the line, uh, you know, as land and water defenders uh, for, you know, the well-beings of, of, of their people, uh, their self-determination, the land, and for us all uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so, you know, their PayPal is right here. You can click on it. Uh, you can go support, uh, follow up their stories. There's always ways, actionable items that, you know, the, those tremendous organizers are putting out there. You know, make sure to please go check them out if you haven't already. And, you know, trying to support, as I said, you know, concretely, not just by sharing the content online, because that's important, but that's not, you know, the work of liberation. You know, it's not about only sharing the content online. If that's the only thing you can do, of course, no judgment pass, but, you know, you know, follow their stories. They're looking for skills for folks there. Uh, you know, send them a DM with what skills you have and, you know, what can you contribute to the cause and they will include you and add you uh, to their list of folks with, uh, you know, with, 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 with skills and experiences. At the end of the day, for settlers who are living on, you know, indigenous land, it is important for us to, you know, be concrete about these, about these issues. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of all I have to say uh, in closing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you for uh, Ladi, uh, you know, for, 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 for coming through and sharing your experience with us. Uh, thank you, Harsha. Uh, you know, for coming here, you know, with, you know, your experience as, you know, someone who experienced state violence, as someone who, uh, you know, is, uh, you, you know, uh, working at the BCCLA as, as an organizer, as a writer. Uh, thank you, Mike, as well, as a thinker, as an organizer, as someone who's, you know, in, you know, facing uh, precarious, you know, on, on, you know, is living in precarity of, you know, the immigration uh, detention uh, or the immigration enforcement system, or the border enforcement, whatever the hell you want to call that, the oppressive and violent uh, immigration system. And as Harsha says it, you know, the border crisis uh, in her new book, uh, you know, we're really like, you know, encouraged by you folks. Uh, I, I love you. I have a lot of love for you. Uh, you know, thank you for, you know, being here with us. And uh, I should maybe like, Shut up now, <laughs> I like ramble for too long, but you know, it, it is important after all, you know, to you know, support each other and be there for each other because it's only each other that can keep each other safe. I hope people who attended the meeting today, uh, the webinar, you know, learned something. Uh, if folks wanna reach out later on with some questions or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to CPEP group on our socials. Uh, or on our email, cpep.action at gmail.com. You know, thank you, uh, Dave, for moderating. Um, you know, thank you uh, to uh, the folks uh, who uh, did the ASL uh, interpretation as well. I have your names, they are right here somewhere, but I am so sorry. Um, I is, yes, so Jennifer, and um, I forgot. Um, your comrades name sorry about that but thank you thank you so much for coming uh, I understand how you know um, you know sometimes it is on short notice that we call on you folks and you folks always show up and uh, you know as you're busy in your lives we're all busy so I let everybody leave now thanks thanks for that Suhail and, and I just give my own thanks to, to everyone who participated you're all huge inspirations to me so it's been a real honor to be on a panel with you all. So thank you very much. And, and, and thank you to our ASL interpreters and to my comrade Suhail and um, comrade Raz who did uh, tech support and all the people in the background who were helping out with this, uh, all our comrades. So thank you very much. Um, so I think what we'll do is um, if anybody wants to stick around and do like a little debrief or if you've just got to go, that's, that's totally cool. But we're just going to end the live session and then it's going to go back to just being like a regular Zoom call that just we're all on. So with that, I'll end the live service and uh, I'll just wave 
do the wave goodbye. <laughs> Bye everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks again. And sorry for the tech difficulties in the beginning. <laughs>